Today's topic is light, energy, and matter waves. But before we begin um, to fully explore the topic, let's familiarize ourselves with three equations that are used to describe, uh, first, the wavelength or frequency, secondly, the energy content of photons, and lastly, uh, we'll look at the Einstein's equation, how it relates. Uh, so, C is equal to lambda nu. This is uh, this B here is actually pronounced nu. It's the Greek letter. Uh, there is one of the three equations that's used with dealing with light energy. C represents the speed of light, which is three times ten to the eighth meters per second. Lambda is used to symbolize the wavelength of light in meters, but very often it's not described in meters. Very often it's uh, written down as angstroms or nanometers. A nu is the frequency with units of seconds to the minus one. What they mean by that is cycles per second. And uh, if you take that uh, unit, you can write it as hertz. Hertz is seconds to the minus one. <clears throat> and it means the number of cycles per second for a frequency of light or even the vibration of a guitar string. For example, we tune A at 440 hertz, meaning the string vibrates 440 times per second. The second equation, E is equal to H nu, uh, relates to the amount of energy that can be carried by a photon. And we'll see later on that a photon represents the smallest um, increment of energy that one uh, that a, a beam of light can carry. It's as, it's as though energy, light energy, were somehow pixelated. You can't go below one photon. You can't have half a photon, for example. And the energy is reported in joules. H represents Planck's constant which has the value of 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules per second. And again, mu is frequency in the seconds to the minus one, also known as hertz. And Einstein's equation, oh, the famous equation, E is equal to mc squared, relates the energy content of matter to the speed of light and the mass of the matter. The first question I want you to look at is uh, to familiarize yourself with the use of these two equations. And it's to, uh, we're going to look at the energy content of a photon at 400 nanometers wavelength and 700 nanometers wavelength. 400 nanometers represents around the limit of visible light toward, tending towards the ultraviolet side of the spectrum, whereas a lambda of 700 nanometers is on the red end of the spectrum. And we were going to calculate which photon has more energy. So in the first step, we use C is equal to lambda nu. We transpose lambda to uh, solve for nu, which is the frequency of the photon. We find it has a pro the first photon of 400 nanometers wavelength has a frequency of 7.49 times 10 to the 14 hertz. The second photon at 700 nanometers has a frequency of 4.28 times 10 to the 14 hertz. So we see that the longer wavelength has a um, lower frequency as well. So then we take E is equal to H nu and we plug in the values for the frequency, multiplying them by the uh, Planck's constant, and we get the value of the energy content for one photon of light at this wavelength. We see that the, the photon that has a frequency of 7.49 times 10 to the 14, which corresponds to the 700 nanometers, has an energy of 4.96 times 10 to the minus 19 joules of energy. The other photon with a frequency of uh, the wavelength of 400 nanometers has this much energy. Sorry, did I reverse them? Yeah, I did. Sorry, it's this way around. This is 400, and this is 700. So we see that the longer photon has lower energy. The photon with a shorter wavelength has a higher energy. And, uh, that's why when we go into the sun, we worry about ultraviolet light and not so much infrared. The ultraviolet light is capable of, because of its higher energy, affecting our DNA and causing a sunburn. Why am I doing this? Well, because the next sort of leap in, in uh, uh, logic, in our thinking, was was made by a scientist by the name of de Broglie, who drew a connection between matter and electromagnetic energy. He proposed the wave-particle duality of nature, a phenomenon that only becomes visible with ultra-small bits of matter. So what he said was that 
if energy is equal to matter, uh, the mass times uh, the speed of light squared, and it also equals h nu, he related the two to each other, did some mathematics, and found that even matter can have a wavelength. So therefore, even particles of mass m and velocity v have a wavelength. And this, uh, this kind of uh, conclusion was applicable to electrons. Electrons are light enough so that they have a wavelength that is measurable. So to, draw an to, draw, to use an example, we, we take this equation and we plug in the value for Planck's constant, which is what we have represented here, the mass of an electron, and the, and the velocity of, um, that we just picked arbitrarily. We give the electron a velocity of 2.19 times 10 to the 6 meters per second, which is about 1 one hundredth the speed of light. So it's not a relativistic speed. We're not dealing with uh, relativistic effects. And we find that using this equation, we can attribute a wavelength to an electron. And that sounds kind of strange, but that idea is, ex is exploited precisely in things like the electron microscope. If you accelerate electrons with magnetic fields, you can focus them and cause them to diverge or converge, just like you would form uh, images with a, with a light beam, you can form images with an electron beam. And that, that's what the electron microscope exploits, this, this notion of focusing um, electrons like waves. So for a large, slow-moving object, wave properties can be discounted. However, for an electron, wave properties can tell as much about the behavior as particle characteristics. And, um, for example, if you find the momentum of an electron, you can relate it to its wavelength. Momentum is defined as mass times velocity. And, um, and lambda, the wavelength, wavelength of electron, is related by Planck's constant divided by mass times velocity, which is another measure of momentum. So the momentum of an electron is directly related to its velocity. The wavelength of electrons is related to their velocity. So Newtonian mechanics was used up to that point. Up to, up to the 19th century, everything in physics was being described using, using Newtonian mechanics, and which is fine for describing the behavior of visible objects at ordinary speeds, meaning speeds that are not close to the speed of light, where relativistic effects begin to appear. Uh, but when we start dealing with electrons, which are very light and, and move very rapidly near, near the atom, the Newtonian mechanics break down. They can't, they're not sufficient to describe what's happening. So the new theory was developed, which is called quantum mechanics, to describe the behavior of things that are really small and move really fast, or both. One of the um, Sidebars to this theory is, is, is something that a scientist by the name of Werner Heisenberg uh, noted was that uh, if you took the momentum of a, of a particle and you multiplied it by its position, he said that according to this new theory, the number could not exceed the value of Planck's constant. What was the practical significance of that? Well, it means that you cannot really determine the momentum of an electron without affecting its position. To give you an analogy, try to locate a marble in a completely darkened room using a beach ball. So if, if, your, if your experiment was to occur with you blindfolded or in a completely darkened room, and the only tool you had for finding out where a marble was, somewhere in the room, was to throw the beach ball at the marble, you would know from the sound that the marble made when you hit it, but as soon as you hit it, you've now changed its position, so the marble is no longer uh, where you thought it was. And this is the, the point of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Momentum times position must be greater than or equal to Planck's constant, because electrons are super light, that is, very, uh, very low mass. If we know their momentum, it is hard to discern their position, and vice versa. Now, using the ideas mentioned above, Schrodinger uh, used an equation that was formulated to describe the movements of a, of a string, of a vibrating string, say like a guitar string. And they had discovered that the vibrations of a string could be quantitated mathematically. 
So he said, why don't we apply these ideas to the movements of an electron? Since electrons are believed to have wave properties, let's see if we can formulate a theory that describes these resonance phenomena in terms of vibrations around the, uh, the nucleus of an atom. And he calculated the total energy of an electron in an atom, both potential and kinetic, and he discovered his equation was solvable with the greatest degree of certainty when certain integer values were used. It was kind of like tuning a radio. Certain, certain, uh, certain numbers provided uh, music, and some of them did. And uh, these integer values are where, what came to be known as quantum numbers that we now use to describe the shapes of different orbitals in electrons. When we solve the Schrodinger wave equation, it gives rise to certain mathematical functions. And those mathematical functions describe areas of higher probability of finding an electron around an atom. But it, again, because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, it's impossible to definitively point out where an electron is. What you, the best you can do is to give an area of high probability. 